Uh, yeah, thank you. So let me begin by saying what the coalescent heuristics are. Um, so they were considering well, the class group of a number field. For example, an imaginary quadratic, very important invariant, the finite abelian group, which means we can split it into p parts, p infinity for each time p. And then that gives us all the information. Um, and we want to know how does this vary from one field to the next? And if you look at data, you look at fields, for any, let's say, quadratic fields, for any p separate two, it seems to behave in a very unpredictable way. So this motivates a uh, conjecture of that the class group behaves in a random way. Um, so I'm going to write a an, an defined notation and when I say the probability, if I have a some set of fields that the class group of K is isomorphic to G, I just mean the number of fields in S such that class group of K is isomorphic to G. Uh, divided by the number of fields. So they conjectured. Oh, wait. That's true. Ah, that. If I look at the set of K that are imaginary quadratic, discriminant less than X, with class group of K, isomorphic to G, or so P and odd prime, G finite billion P group. Uh, the probability is equal in the limit to one divided by the order of the automorphism of the root of Z times a funny infinite product, J is one to infinity, one minus P to the minus. Okay. And this agrees with <laughs> numerical evidence to a tremendous order of accuracy. Um, and, uh, but it's very restricted. It's only studying these imaginary quadratic fields. Um, and so this motivates a kind of program programs, <clears throat> which is to find the greatest possible, greatest possible plausible generalization. Of this potential. So this question, is incredibly hard. We're not trying to prove theorems. We're just trying to understand what is true. And we'd like to, get, to write down a formula which has convincing evidence for it. And it turns out that the problem is tricky enough that just that, just finding a, a formula with, with, so, with solid evidence behind it is already a hard problem that you know, people have been working on for Sometimes aren't finished with. So um, there was further work of Cohen and Lenstra. Um, where K is over Q is, is totally real. Um, and Abelian. Um, but then Cohen and Martinet um, said, you know, we'll handle the, the general case. So they were looking at. Um, gamma, a finite group, um, 
and V a ZP adjoint gamma module. Um, and you want to know the probability, and it's F a field, field, probability, looking over K over F, now with Galois extension, with Galois group gamma, um, and discriminant K over S. Plus the x, <laughs> the probability that the class group of k now with the action of gamma is isomorphic to v. Um, and they wrote down a prediction, which I don't want to write down in particular because it is almost certainly wrong. It didn't get the right answer. Um, so, and then well, I guess we need to have P not by the order of gamma. So, the analog here of the oddness condition. This is probably wrong when base field F contains P three to the So it's always wrong when, when P is two. And for most other primes, you know, for most fields don't have to be unity, but you can always find fields where this is problematic. And why do we think it's wrong? Well, Mala found numerical evidence, according to Mala who found numerical evidence. Um, and after. They are theoretically mean it's provably wrong, or yeah. uh, it's provably wrong in the function field case in the Q to infinity limit. And I think the function field case also matches the, the numerical data reasonably well. So the two perspectives are, are consistent with each other. So there are fixes. In special cases, stuff like Mala and Garton and uh, Michael Kowski, Jerry Zimmerman, and myself. Um, and ah, uh, what? Melanie, what and I have written wrote down a, a, a reasonable formula in in general. general that properly accounts for roots of unity. Um, so I mean, we didn't prove it, so we all only think is that we strongly believe uh, it, it's correct, but um, one thing I'll explain during the talk is why we, we, we think this is right and, and how it avoids kind of the, the thing that causes problems for, for Cohen and Martin. Um, and so this is in, this is work in progress. Uh, it has two parts. One part is going to be done very soon. If you want it, I'll send it to you. I'll put it on the archive soon. The other part, hopefully not too long after that. The second part is the part that has the actual formula. So, yeah, so this whole thought will be on that joint work. Um, I guess I should mention also in, in the talk into the abstract that next week, Melanie will be talking about a different aspect of our joint work where we apply the same ideas 
to methods in um, the topology. Uh, and so um, this fix should work, could also apply to the non Hegelian case. That we'll do in further in the future, so I won't write down any specifics about that. What do I mean by non abelian? Well, the class group of K is the Galois group of the maximal abelian unramified extension of K. And so it's very natural to just delete the word abelian and try to understand instead of statistics of class groups, the statistics of Galois groups. Um, and, and, and so that is considered part of the non abelian polymester program. Um, and that is really what we, what we would like as, as kind of target the, the greatest possible generalization. So you mean maximal unrounded times? You mean the fundamental group? Like, yeah, so regular. yes. An equivalent thing is pi one of spec OK. And so to, to advertise Melanie's talk, well, you might analogize that to pi one of a three manifold. And that's, you know, sh she'll be talking about. Uh, and that, that paper is available uh, on the distribution of pi one of a three manifold. Uh, and then, yes, we, we eventually hope to apply the techniques to pi one of spec. Okay. How do you order the three manifolds? What, what do you oh, think? Right. How do you order the three manifolds? Uh, the, the, the method is, is in a paper of Dunfield and Thurston by random right. number splitting. Yeah, I'm sure Melanie will explain it carefully. Or you can look at the paper of Dunfield and Thurston. Or our paper, it's on the artificial. Um, so uh, uh, so I, I'm going to write down some of our formulas. But before I do that, I want to explain some of the ideas behind that. What new ideas did we introduce to the problem? Um, and um, the, the key ideas um, have to do with the notion of moments. So, uh, a moment in probability theory, instead of considering the probability of an event, you consider the expectation of a natural function. Um, and so in this case, so by, by expectation of a set of fields of function, like the number of surjections mm -hmm. of class group of K uh, to G, I just mean the sum over K and the set of the number of surjections. Divided by the cardinals. Um, so our, our, our strategy um, is in two steps. Wait, right, this is just the first one. What? Can have higher moments? No. Uh, so we consider that to be a higher moment because if G, if G is something very complicated, then it behaves like a higher order moment. So okay. So maybe the the so one moment you could study is the cardinality of the class group raised to the power n, which is like the number of maps. It's the same thing as HOM from the class group to QP mod ZP to the N, which is the sum over G spinal subgroups of QP mod ZP to the N, the surjections from the class group of K to Z. So this, these moments include as linear combinations every power of, of the cardinality. So they really do behave like, like all, all moments 
and not like just the first first land. You need that for every G. For every G, yeah. So, well, let, let me. I, all I've done so far is just define some, some notation. <laughs> let's let's. So let me say, so step one is to conjecture a value for the limit as x goes to infinity, the expectation over extensions of f that are Galois, Galois group is isomorphic to gamma. Uh, hence, uh, of the number of surjections as DP adjoint gamma modules from the class group of K to V. Conjecture this for all V. And two, prove that this conjecture, or we want to say, nicely use this is part one to provably calculate the distribution. So rather than conjecturing a distribution directly, we want to conjecture moments and prove that every distribution that has those moments is equal to a particular distribution we can write down. Um, and so why do we want to do it this way? Why is it better to start with the moments and then go to the distribution? Uh, so one is that formulas for moments are just simple. The, the, the formulas we can write down that are that are that are plausible just have way many fewer terms. So it's much it's much easier to be confident you got the right formula if it's a simple and elegant expression rather than some nasty sum of products or products of sums. So we'll write a very simple conjecture that agrees with all the evidence, and that will be more convincing. Second, uh, we can often calculate moments uh, in the function field context. Um, either in lim the limit q to infinity uh, or, or kind of approximately. But the approximately is because of work of Ellenberg, Vankatesh, and Westra. And what they did is for the original Cohen Lester conjecture, they calculated the function field version of the moments, at least, you know, with Q sufficiently large with respect to the particular moment you're taking, the particular group, um, or some error depending on Q, but in, in a large degree limit with error depending on Q. Uh, they calculated these moments, and then they proved that every distribution with these moments is, uh, is a particular distribution that matches cohen lenstra and so they concluded a version of the cohen lenstra distribution in the function context. So um, if we want to use evidence from the function field setting to test our conjecture, it makes sense to start with a moment conjecture because moments are what's accessible over function fields. And that's the primary way we came to our moment conjecture is we tested it in function field. We didn't do, we didn't achieve everything Ellenberg, Rankin, and Westerland did in their case, but we did it in the Q to infinity. Um, and the third is you can, can occasionally compare to number field results. So this moment is kind of the same as counting like extensions L over F, where the Galois group of L is like this like semi-direct product of V with gamma. 
And for very small values of V and gamma, like gamma is equal to Z mod two and V is equal to Z mod three, this is a kind of S3. This would be something that you can count by uh, you know, number theoretic techniques. Uh, and so you, you, in addition to functional evidence, you can get a little bit of number evidence. For the, the non-abelian case, you can get a little bit of evidence from the work of Bargava on S4 and S5 counting. Uh, and, 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 it's, and similar results like that. So moments are much easier to understand both the function field context and the number field context and just by looking at the formulas and then using moments, we can get the measure, the probabilities. Well, non-compactness where moments don't determine the measure. So, so the actual theorem we proved, we proved the theorem giving criteria where moments determine the measure. Um, and so, yeah, so it's not, I'm not just talking about conjecture, that's kind of a theorem, okay. um, but there's something more to it than that. So, so such theorems existed previously. We have proven a more general theorem of the four moments determine the measure that has existed previously in the setting of Cohen Lesser, certainly. Um, and um, also you want you want the limit of moments to equal to the moment of limit. That's something that we have to prove, but there's something we did, which, which I think is, is very important, which is we, um, so in, in prior work, you would guess a distribution, uh, and then you would check the distribution has, has the right moments. And then you would check it's uniquely determined by its moments. Um, so there's a something very unsatisfying in the step one here, where you've got to guess the distribution because you just kind of come up with it out of nowhere, or you come up with a random model. You say, our class groups are going to behave like random groups with these generators and relations, and then you calculate a random model, but you kind of have to come up with a random model out of nowhere. Um, and in addition to being kind of morally unsatisfying, this method, as we went to these more general cases, these arbitrary roots of unity cases and non abelian cases, this method was failing. People were having to come up with like increasingly complicated random models. Um, and we, we do not know an a priori reason to write down the correct, like a priori motivation for the measure formula in the, the, the most general non abelian roots of unity case. Our only hope is to get it, is to calculate what it is using the moments. So, um, so the new goal is given a formula for the measure output a formula for the moments. So there's no, there's no guesswork. You can get a measure formula. Well, there's a little bit. You get a measure formula in the function field case by just calculating point counterpoints on some space. And then you have to guess a little bit to think, how do we convert that to the number field case? And then you just kind of turn a crank of the machine and it spits out a formula for the measure. How would you sample from this distribution? Um, it depends on gamma. Yeah, it's, it, does it, it's your... Does it come with a kind of natural way of so sort of just that if gamma is an abelian group, you can sample from it using class field theory. If gamma is uh, no, I mean your oh this distribution. Yeah, your your distribution did uh, no. I well, okay. So this in the abelian case, the conjecture is that in the abelian case, we do actually know a random model which involves writing down certain kinds of random matrices. Uh, but not when gamma, abelian means gamma is abelian. No, uh, so for the class group. So in, in the setting I'm talking about this talk, we do know a random model. Oh, okay, for any gamma. For any gamma, okay. But I, I don't but think, I, just, I, I, I don't think it's that like interesting. I think the random models are not necessarily telling us something important about 
the number of fields, what matters is the distribution. And I think it's better to get the distribution by going directly from the moments. But it's interesting to have a way to sample it. It is interesting. I mean, yes. So we, we can, we can um, yeah, so there is an approach. There is an approach to sampling that's suggested by the method. There's an inductive construction in the paper, and there's this is just an, a, 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 a like a dynamic, a stochastic process approach to sampling where you build the group a bit a bit at a time, which I guess is not it's not completely different from what Alex Smith does in the class group, two part of class group where he builds it two, four, eight, sixteen, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's an approach to sampling like that. I guess. So what I want to do next is write down some of our formulas just so that the talk is not going to be entirely hand waving. Um, and then I will say more about how we prove the actual theory part. So um, I'm going to first write a formula for gamma is isomorphism. Uh, and P is two, and our base field F is two. So we're looking at the two part of the class group of cyclic cubic extensions of the rational numbers. Um, and so in this case, class group of K is a um, F two of X module X cubed minus one module. But the the gamma, the Z mod three invariant part, part is trivial. So you get F two of X X modulo X squared plus X plus one, which is just F. So you can think of the class group as just a vector space over F. Um, and we predict the probability that the class group is isomorphic to F4 to the E is Q to the E squared over the cardinality of GLE F4. Times product equals one to infinity. Um, and so th th this is actually uh, this this one this one is due to Mala. I'm just putting it because the simple uh, example. Oh, I actually should have written more this formula. A different formula is the formula for the moment. Um, actually, let me just write it over here. What do I expect the moment to equal? Um, if F, F, if F contains P to the R three to unity, <laughs> not p to the r plus one, it should equal, if you look at wedge 2v, the p to the r torsion, gamma invariance, divided by the cardinality of v to the u, uh, where you go, okay, so the power u, where u is the number of For R so the, the wedge to V comes right out of the function field counting is one of the components of some Hurwitz space, the space parameterized elements of the class of the balance of the dual. And then dividing by cardinality V to the U is, is kind of the standard way to account for places that have it. So um Uh, oh, actually, so not 
actually it's actually being linked to. So, but, sorry, things are a little bit in flux. So what we have, instead of dividing by the automorphism group, as Colin Lester did, we take the moment and divide by the automorphism group, and then we multiply by something that is an infinite product, which is not too much more complicated. Uh, uh, and if gamma is z mod three, t is two, uh, and for general f, f has u infinite places, Prediction is only slightly more complicated. It's two to the e squared minus probability of class group k is perfect to f four to the e two to the e squared minus two u e divided by g l e f four times the product was one. To infinity, one over one plus four to the one half minus. Maybe I have an off by one error in here. Wait, wait, wait. It's probably an off. Um, then the, so this the, the first one is basically the Amala, and the second formula is, you know, a, a pretty straightforward extrapolation of, of what's in Mala. Um. But um, next, I want to give a formula that seems to be completely new. Uh, so let's consider uh, gamma. Z mod seven, P is two. Oh, sorry, oh, that was bad. These should all be two torsion. So I'm only gonna write down the formula for the P torsion. Sorry about this. I'm only gonna write down the formula for the P torsion today because the other formula was too complicated. We have them, but they're very complicated. Uh, and I don't wanna write them down in this time. Uh, but the P torsion formulas already show some interesting uh, phenomena. Q. Um, in that case, we get a module for F2 of X, modulo X to the 6 plus X to the 5 plus X to the 4 plus X to the 3 plus X squared plus X. This one, which is F8 squared. So the class group has split into two different vector spaces over 8. One of them, the Galois group, acts by a particular character, the other acts by the opposite. Um, and so we, we, we write down the probability the class group of K is isomorphic to uh, two torsions. The first copy of F8, the power E1, times the second copy of the power E2 should equal. First of the moment, eight to the e one e two minus e one minus e two divided by the automorphism. So it's GL F one of F eight. GL E two of F eight times some weird infinite product. One minus eight to the minus j. Um, times one plus eight inverse if e one is equal to e two. One if e one minus e two differ by one, and zero uh, otherwise. So the class group. Is has two pieces, and the sizes of the two pieces must be very close together. They can't be independent. 
Um, and it's significant because all the prior work on special cases, it kind of considered just one exponent at a time. Uh, and it did consider the case when you had multiple different case representations that might, or multiple different pieces that might be dependent on each other. So in the, in the original work of Cohen and Martinet, they just assumed that split into different pieces corresponding to various representations, they're all independent of each other. Um, and then Mala and Lovnatsky and Zimmerman and myself fixed it in particular cases that were like this, where you only have one piece. Um, so this, this, this dependence phenomenon seems to be uh, new for, for, from our work. So can you prove that at the level of class group? Uh, probably. <laughs> we, we don't have a proof written down, but you can probably prove it using the, the pairing um, in the pairing that was written down in my, in my paper with the Maskians are the kind of kind of castles take care on the class group. And um, so in the same setting, gamma is Z mod seven, P is two, F general. Um, uh, the formula involves these Q binomial coefficients. So write like this, A choose B Q inverse for A, B uh, natural numbers or integers. Um, is the product J one to A, one minus Q to the minus J, by the product J one to B, one minus Q to the minus J, product J one to A minus B, one minus Q to the minus J. Um, if zero is less than equal to A, less than equal to B, and zero otherwise. So then the formula is the probability that the class group of K isomorphic to Z mod two, so two torsions, isomorphic to F one times F two should equal A to the F one, E one, E two, minus U, E one, minus U, E two. Divide by the automorphisms. That's easier. Go to F one of F eight. G L two of F eight. I have some binomial coefficient to you choose F1 minus F2 plus U. A inverse times the product. Um, and so for the general case, you're just going to take the formulas that I wrote down already and kind of squish them together, to multiply them together. Oh, yeah, one plus, yeah, one minus. Thank you. Hmm. What was U? U is the number. Oh, so U is the number of infinite places. Oh. I see. So, so, so now F one and F two can differ by up to U. Exactly. The more infinite places, the more they can. Differ. Uh, um. So. Uh, the general is the V0 through Vn be the irreducible representations of gamma over Fp. Um, then uh, 
it got containing the peace roots immunity. With U and Pisces, uh, we want P and an octave by the order of gamma. Uh, we're going to let Q I is equal to the cardinality of the endomorphisms of the I, which is always a finite field. D I is equal to the dimension over F Q I of the I. And epsilon i is the Fermanian 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 um, so you can you can do things to make there be a limiting distribution, uh, and but that is much harder. like two torsion. For, for, yeah, so for two torsion, yeah, for, yeah. So for two torsion for a quadratic, there's just no distribution at all, and then there, there there there's there's tricks to let you consider four torsion as something random, and then you consider like two torsion of a cubic, but it's not Galois. We're considering the Galois case, and so it's a, uh, I mean. We're both just generally simplified, but also just like our, our methodology. We, we need, we're going to need new ideas. Yeah. So then the probability that the class group of K is isomorphic to prod I equals zero to the N, the I to the I should equal the moment wedge to prod I equals the I to the I. By, by the automorphisms, uh, times the product over the all i that are self dual. So all i such that vi that are going to vi dual of some infinite product. Product j equals one to infinity, one over one plus qi to the j plus u di plus epsilon i minus one over two times the product over i and i prime pairs, where i is not equal to i prime, but v i is isomorphic to v i prime dual. So these are pairs of representations where one is dual to the other um, of a binomial coefficient to u d i, choose e i minus e i prime plus u d i. QI inverse times on infinite product on the exact infinity. Well, thanks to QI. Um, so that is the complete theory of like the P part of the class group for fields of particularity. And we have formulas for the higher P parts, but I'm not going to write them down. So how did we do this? Oh, there should be, I guess I should have a gamma to the U. Or be the to match the moment. This is a conjecture. <laughs> it's a conjecture. The theorem is that it follows from the conjecture generally on the moment. And the uh, um, and so that's what I want to talk about next is like what did we actually prove? Um, and so uh, I, I think it's it's helpful to think about the moment and measure problem in kind of uh, generality. So. Um, if you write all ZP of gamma modules, <coughs> the fix, fix on enumeration, 
uh, M1, M2, dot, 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 of all isomorphism classes. Um, and I'll choose them in order of non-decreasing size. Then we can write our probability distribution. So it's a big vector. The vector mu, where mu i is the probability of m i. And our moments as another vector, where <clears throat> M I is equal to the sum over I probability modulo M I times over J, the probability of the modulo M J times the number of surjections from M J to M I. Want to find mu given yeah. So this is just another formulation of the moment problem. And this relationship can be written as just a matrix multiplication of vectors, infinitely long vectors, where Aij uh, is equal to the number of surjections from Mj. So if you write it like this, there's a very obvious guess for what the answer should be, which is U should equal A inverse times M. Because these are infinity by infinity matrices, it's this is not a trivial theorem. This is something you have to prove. Um, in fact, A inverse might not even exist. Um, well, A inverse exists formally because A is upper triangular. So there's only surjections from bigger modules to smaller modules, uh, which makes A an upper triangular matrix. And so here, right, A is like diagonal plus strictly upper triangular matrix. Then A inverse is equal to D inverse minus D inverse T D inverse plus the inverse T, the inverse T, the inverse T, and so on. Uh, and this converges entry lines. Um, so uh, so we want to show the existence of a uh, measure with these moments, which is saying that if mu is equal to A inverse M, then M is equal to A mu. And we want to show the uniqueness, which is the same as saying that if M is equal to A mu, then mu is equal to A inverse M. So the, the, if, if, if the, the moments, the measure given by the natural formula is actually correct as for moments, and any other measure that has the right moment given by the natural formula, which means we basically just need to exchange the order of summation when we're multiplying A by A inverse N. So we need to show A inverse times A mu is equal to mu, and A times A inverse M is equal to M. So we have to, to do that, to, to use associativity of matrix multiplication, we've got to exchange an order of summation, which is non-trivial because it's an infinitely long sum. So we just have to do some analysis. Um, so it's just basically controlling tails. Um, yeah, you, you, you could say that. So I mean, you could have escaped the non-compactness info. Yeah. Is that easy? So, no. I mean, once 
you figure out the right framework to do it in, it's not, it's not so hard, but it, it took a lot of work to find, find the right frame. Um, I mean, so let, let me say what we were doing, what we were doing before. Like for example, what I was doing with, with, with Nask and Zimmerman, we were trying, we need to understand the analytic properties of A inverse. And so we we're understanding this sum. We can maybe bound D inverse and bound C. And so we can bound D inverse C, D inverse. We can bound each term of the sum independently by bounding D and bounding T. Um, and that gives you an analytic approach, proving the bounds you want, but it's hard. So our approach is to just find an exact formula for A inverse. So this inverse is not some random, purely formal object. It's not some arbitrary infinite sum. This formal inverse is something that has a nice that it has a nice formula for, um, which has to do um, A inverse IJ is like the sum over surjections from MJ to MI of the Mobius function of the host set of submodules, just so surjections, submodules of curve f uh, divided by odd mi on m. So uh, the, the key thing is to consider Mobius functions of post -act which are related to inverses of certain convolution operations defined in post sets. And once you realize that's what you're supposed to be looking at. That's where we control something in I and J. Just having a formula that I, J can Yes, it, it, that's the first step. But it makes it much easier to control when you have this formula. In particular, because Mobius, uh, this Mobius function, so the mu of submodules of Kerr F, this is only non-zero when uh, Kerr F is p-torsion. So a priori, this inverse function could be an arbitrary arbitrary triangular matrix. Its entries could be non-vanishing for basically any pair of modules where one maps to the other, one is bigger than the other. But in fact, the only module that's supported on are modules that are increased by a little bit, increased by a p torsion. So when you're doing these sums, you only have to worry about some, like p torsion extensions of your, your module. Um, uh, and then, For the for the existence for the uniqueness, we just we find explicit bounds on the moments uh, that let us that give us absolute convergence letting us exchange the sign. So what we do, we, we need to, to exchange exchange order summation. The easiest way to do that is when the sum is absolutely covered. Um, and we have a good enough control on this Mobius function that just from some reasonable criteria on the moments, we have enough information to check the sum is absolutely convergent and we check that our actual moments satisfy these criteria. 
Um, and then we do this in great generality. So we can prove a theorem for modules, but we know we actually are in our next work are going to want to consider non-Euclidean groups. And not just any non-Euclidean groups, non-Euclidean groups with some extra structure. We have an action of gamma, and we will also care about elements of their third homology. And so we can prove a theorem for those objects, but it's pretty clear that pretty soon someone is going to come up with a new case where they're gonna to wanna to do the same kind of stuff for the distribution, which wasn't covered by our theorem. So what we try to find is what is the most general setting in which we could run this argument, make this calculation, do this analysis, um, and also do the analysis in the other case. Um, and we, we like define a suitable class of categories where the quotients of an object for a modular lattice. There's some other criteria but that's the most important. This is the lattice in the center of poses. Exactly. So the quotients of an object in any category form a poset, or the quotients up to a modular set. Um, and what I would like is, is them, them to be a, a, a lattice, meaning for any two like quotients, there's, there's one. Um, smaller than both, and there's one that's, you know, there's a, minute, there's a maximum one smaller than both, and there's a minimal one bigger than both. And I want it to be finite, for finitely many quotients. And I want a version of the Jordan Holder property. If I have a maximal sequence of, of quotients getting smaller and smaller and smaller, or larger and larger and larger, depending on what order you do it, I want the maximal sequence to have an order, which is the length, which is independent of the sequence I chose. And what does the modular mean? That, that means mod, that's, 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 uh, that's modular. Uh, and so this includes the category of finite groups, the category of finite rings, the category of finite modules, Lie algebras over a finite field. Uh, it includes the opposite of the category of finite sets for natural notion of morphisms on finite sets. So it includes both the, the, the kind of key categories we want to study and a lot of other categories that perhaps people might want to study in the future. We prove the general measure for moments reconstructed theorem in all these settings, but by a kind of a uniform method. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so the last thing I'll say is. For uniqueness, we do this in, kind of in a very direct method. For existence in the general, like non even setting, it's more common. Our sums are not absolutely common. So we don't get enough like cancellation just from understanding A inverse to get them to absolutely converge. So instead, we do something much more careful where we change the sums one step at a time. And each step we can break into pieces, and the pieces are absolutely convergent. Um, and, and so for, for, for modules, the, the way the piece argument works is you like first consider the P part and the P squared part, P cubed part, and, and so on. You go one power P at a time. And you know, for groups, you would go one finite simple group at a time. Thank you for inviting me to speak. You have this measure, and if you're ever going to prove a theorem, that it applies to, you will have a sequence of measures. Yes. And since you have a theorem which says that if you control these moments, then I don't have escape of mass. Yes. Is. So that is part of our theorem. The proof is, is somewhat like overlaps and it's somewhat distinct. In particular, it also uses the same kind of inductive argument to avoid on uh, escape of mass. So we prove that. If the moments all converge to something finite, then the limit of the moments is equal to the moment of the lattice. Um, and we do it, I mean, it's, it's a version of the same method you always do. You argue that controlling the higher moments, the higher moments bound with lower moments to such an extent that there can't be an escape of mass. Um, you're, you're, and there's no relation to the classical theorems of hamburger and so on. Um, I don't know. I don't know the I mean, They invented this theory to get so, measures on the line instead of 
Well, let me, let me tell you the following. Okay. Thing. Well, let's just uh, bias stress. One, one special case of our theorem has to do with measures not on the real line, but on the natural numbers. Yeah. And, and, then, and then the usual notion of modes. So the opposite of the category of finite sets in that category are theorem specializes and theorem of measures on the natural numbers. So our theorem does specialize something that is also possibly a special case of their theorem. Although one, one can get, one can, it's easier to prove that when the measures are restricted to align the natural numbers than when they're arbitrary. So I don't know how our criterion compares to their criterion, but there is that like direction of overlap. But yeah, I mean, so the, the I mean, you, you use the domain convergence theorem. Like, how else are you going, going, going to do it? Right? You got you got to find something that like dominates it sufficiently. Um, is it something? Yeah. And, and and then the point is to do algebra in a general category to find something that dominates it well enough, uh, and that's what we're able to do under some mild assumptions. More questions. Any questions from Zoom? You gotta pick on somebody. <laughs> now on Zoom. <laughs> it's gotta be somebody friendly with otherwise. <laughs> on Zoom, it says Sam. Yeah, I mean, I have to log in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if there are no more questions, oh, no, no. Josh, <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Bill again.